start the, the panel discussion. So we're grateful to uh, uh, Christina Ballantyne, uh, Joshua Mills, and Marie Jamison for uh, putting in some work and being willing to, to put this on. And particularly Marie is doing double duty, giving a talk and working on this, uh, serving on this panel. Um, so they will be moderating the panel. Um, I want this, we want this to be interactive. So um, we want lots of audience participation as well. So don't be shy to ask questions. Um, and I will just ask some prompts to the panel to uh, start the conversation. Um, right, so we thought it would be a good idea if people would uh, just begin by talking about who they are and their experiences and uh, where they are in their careers right now. Uh, so Christina, do you wanna start? Sure, I'm Christina Ballantyne. I am at the College of the Holy Cross, which is a liberal arts college in Worcester, Massachusetts. So that's about an hour west of Boston. And I just finished my 20th year <laughs> there. So, um, um, so I should tell you a little bit about what it is like to be at a liberal arts college. My teaching load is 3-2. I teach three courses one semester and two another, that we do earn course releases when we teach courses that meet four times a week. If whenever we teach four of those, we get a course release. So I've had quite a few years with a two-two teaching load. It's also a place that requires research and values research. So um, it's a nice combination of a place that appreciates teaching, but also appreciates and requires research. And that's kind of what I was looking for. Um, I should say that before coming to Holy Cross, I was on the job market for five years in a row. So uh, that one of those years, it was a two year postdoc. So I only applied selectively. So I have a lot of experience applying for jobs a long time ago. All right, so I guess it's uh, one time. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm Josh Mayos. Uh, I finished my PhD last year from Cologne, Germany. Um, and now I'm in Winnipeg, up in Canada. Um, I just have a one-one teaching load. I'm pretty fortunate. I got a fellowship from Pacific Institute uh, for Mathematical Sciences. So I don't have to teach too much. Um, so I'm definitely the earliest career stage of the three panelists. Uh, so I've only applied for jobs once. So I'll be interested to see uh, the answers from the other panelists as well. Um, in terms of applying for more postdoc positions, tenure track positions. Um, so at my institution at the moment, it's kind of a equivalent to maybe a lower R1 in the US. Um, so it's very research focused, um, but there are a lot of instructor positions with more teaching focus. Um, but obviously with my position, I spending maybe 80% of my time on research. And up until I think two weeks ago or so, everything was still online. So I've been working from home for the last three years-ish. Um, so I haven't really got too much experience in going into the department teaching in person, um, but in the next few months, hopefully I will. Uh, yeah. um, so my name is Marie Jameson. Um, let's see. So I, I guess I'll go through my whole <laughs> trajectory because I, I've been involved in various ways in a number of different kinds of institutions. Um, so I started out in, as an undergraduate in a small liberal arts college, um, I guess liberal, a liberal arts college that was focused on math and science and engineering. So an especially here in the liberal arts college. Um, and after that experience, I went to um, University of Wisconsin for my graduate school. Um, although I did switch to Emory University um, partway through when my advisor um, was in the So I got the experience of being in a large um, public university and a smaller private university. university. So when I graduated, I get I like sort of won the lottery and um, right out of my PhD I got a tenure track position at the University of Tennessee. So I've only been on the job market once. And I've been at the University of Tennessee now for the past eight years, having recently received tenure. Um, and 
South Carolina. So the University of Tennessee is a is a research focused place. We've got um, about 30,000 um, students. And I guess we're talking about teaching mode too. My teaching mode is uh, 2 1. And yeah, am I missing any detail? No. Maybe I'll, I'll well, say more you. in response to questions as they come. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, we wanted to talk about the differences in applying to different types of schools in a little bit. I thought maybe Josh, uh, we, we wanted to talk in particular about uh, you've moved country several times for work. And if you have thoughts on that or in particular, you know, if you if you move abroad for work, how it, is it easy to move back home or what things you have to consider in terms of people, you know, remembering who you are and, and keeping up visibility if you want to move back to your home country and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, so I have moved countries twice. So I grew up in England um, and then I moved to Germany on about two months notice for my PhD. And then I moved to Winnipeg last summer, so cross continental. Um, there are a few different things that I made some notes on, but they're not very clear. Um, first one is the most obvious one is language changes. So for a lot of people here, you'll probably move maybe from an English speaking country to another English speaking country. And everything's very easy. If you're going to go somewhere where there's not primarily English speaking, um, I would urge you to at least learn some words before you go. I turned up to Germany, could barely speak any German, and it was horrible for the first couple of months, um, just adjusting to new language, new culture. Um, I'm sure that happens for a lot of people moving to any new place, it's always a new culture, but sometimes when you don't speak the language, it's very difficult. Um, my second point was on adjusting to new academic systems. Um, so between the UK and Germany, the system is very different. And again, between Germany and North America, the system is different again. There are different semesters, different times, there are breaks, different rules about what you can and can't do, when you have to teach, when you can take vacations. Um, so maybe um, a thing to note here would be to ask in advance. If you're thinking about moving to, say, Germany or Europe, um, obviously, every country is different and every institution is different. So try and ask in advance um, what their rules are, maybe what their semesters are like. So before I moved to Germany, I didn't know it was a six-month, six-month semester, and there's not really any break. We just go, 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 and then exams happen, and then maybe two weeks later, we start teaching. And I didn't know that before I turned up. Obviously, I got to know that. Um, but then moving, say, to Canada, where exams finish, Two and a half weeks ago, and now I'm off until September. So it's just very different where you have different, um, say, peaks and valleys of teaching and research. Um, and then the final point that Larry brought up was how to potentially move back to countries uh, that you've moved away from. Um, and so far, I'm finding it very difficult, um, very useful, sorry, to try and keep up projects with people you've worked with before. So, say, um, so I moved from Catherine Greenwood's group over to Canada. I'm doing my best to keep up at least one or two projects working with Catherine or her group, so that at least I have a tie to potentially go back there in the future. So those are the my main points. I guess I've only moved once post PhD, so maybe other people in the audience have some some topics they'd like to bring up in this. So yeah, any comments from the audience? Has anyone like moved intercontinentally? Okay. How was your experience moving? Well, I mean, I left Australia in 2015 to do my PhD um, at Illinois. Um, and then I, I moved to a post of Caltech and I did my second year. So I've only done one okay. continental move and I, I'm not a fan of doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> and so actually, in my experience, so like in terms of going back, so sort of the way hiring works in Australia is they don't really hire internally, they hire externally. So the ironic thing was I really had to leave in order to go back. And then I kind of dropped here and then I got stuck because I messed with them. And so now I I don't want to move any continent anymore. So I, <laughs> I want to stay. So yeah. And was like the transition easy enough for you? Um to grad school was fine. I mean it was a little rough, but I mean it was English speaking to English speakers, so it was fine. And then I mean going to grad school was pre grad program. Than the other students in my year. So socially, I mean, it was okay. Yeah, it was fine. Mm -hmm. Wasn't as, you know, to move to Germany. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think it would have been okay with more more time to prepare. Yeah. yeah. And, um, mm. Not so much. Uh, anyone else moved into content had experiences that were good or bad? Or... <laughs> and I uh, went to Austria for my PhD. Okay. Yeah, so very similar to going to Germany, I guess. Uh, there was a bit of a culture shock for a few months. But you get schnitzel. You do get schnitzel. That's, that's, for me, food was the biggest part of culture shock. So being in a country that had to do it easy on stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, I'm in a, a similar interesting situation where I, I'm there and uh, I like it there a lot. And uh, it's, it's, there's a risk of stuff, I guess. You have to, I, I'm guessing that you have to, if you want to stay in university, you have to be able to, you have to be willing to move around mm -hmm. and wherever the jobs are. I'm not certain. Yeah, I still have to go up on the ground. So. Mm. And I think we would all say that uh, if you do want to move back home, it's important to try to occasionally, at least or as often as you can, go to con conferences in your home country. So that, I mean, if you if you're gone for three or five years, I mean, people just you know you're just not as much on people's radars if you just don't go in the same circles and um, and say, so Ian, you just moved you moved the most recently abroad of probably anyone. Yeah, there. I guess I uh, started in Catherine's group in Germany in February. And so uh, I do want to move back. So we'll see how that goes. I'm uh, uh, Catherine's maybe hopefully not logged in, but I don't think she'll take offense to that. But um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I think maybe learn on the go about like how to stay relevant. I, I think this is, this is good advice. So, uh, Try and come to conferences and stay in contact with a lot of people. I will say I'd like to stress Josh's point of like uh, asking about how departments run or how universities run in other countries wasn't even something that really crossed my mind before I moved. Um, and so I'm very lucky I don't have to teach at all right now. I don't think anyone there would want me to teach because I can't speak German at all. Um, but but even uh, small things about. Uh, 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 taking research visits or taking trips, even uh, uh, the next town over, next city over, there are very different rules there compared to uh, uh, at least Vanderbilt, where, where I was beforehand. Um, and so these are things that I didn't think about at all, but they're like little everyday things that affect your quality of life a little bit that um, you have to get used to. And so it's, uh, I don't think any one of them is like a, a deal breaker or anything like that, but uh, uh, yeah, I think having the most information you can for before moving is, is valuable. And so uh, I guess maybe I wish I would have asked a, a lot more questions before, before arriving. So. But as both of you have experienced in Cologne and, and myself as well, uh, the university has a lot of support structure to help you find an apartment and help you settle and help you apply for the visa and all of those things, and probably many universities are the same if you just ask. I will say, yeah, in Germany, if you learn how to follow the rules, everything <laughs> happens very efficiently and they'll help you out, but uh, the rules are all not always what you expect. Great. Yeah, and this shouldn't dissuade young people from considering applying and then going, going abroad. It can be a great experience. And one thing I just want to say very briefly that I found very valuable about moving abroad is that uh, people do different types of mathematics in, in different places. There, there are different influences or bigger, uh, different big people that influence circles of thinking. And just by physically being in a different place, you will, you know, even if you do modular forms, for example, in a different country, it's likely that you'll see very different perspectives that will influence your thinking or influence the types of techniques you know and are, and are in, uh, in, influenced by. So there's a lot to gain also, but there is a lot to consider about what, how, how it impacts your life and how it impacts your future uh, career as well. Great, so maybe we should move on um, to other topics as well. Um, so we wanted to talk about, um, as, as we saw that the panelists have are at different sorts of institutions and have been at different sorts of institutions, um, what it's like and what the different differing expectations are uh, applying to different sorts of institutions. In particular, for instance, you know the difference between what your documents should look like or, or what's the expectation when applying to an R1 school or a liberal arts school. And, you know, I can say from personal experience, I have had very different reactions to my response, my applications in liberal arts schools and in R1 schools. And I don't think I 
when I was applying, I don't think I had a, a lot of concrete. I, I heard a lot of advice from my advisor about how to apply to places that I think was particularly relevant to R1 schools. And I, um, I, didn't, I didn't hear a lot of advice about how to apply to a liberal arts school. And I don't think I, I had a lot of success in applying to liberal arts schools. And um, from the very nuggets, little tidbits of information I've heard, in some cases, they can be con very conflicting things that you, should, that, that you should do in the different situations. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just say I don't have so much experience. I've only applied in one round and I've only really been at research institutions. So I'm interested to hear the answers to this as well. Larry, can you clarify is this for postdoc or for gender transition or both? Uh, I guess both. Yeah. Or for instance, um, and maybe Christina, you can um, start uh, this as well. Um, we were talking when we were discussing setting up this panel, like, do you think that people should have multiple versions of different documents for different types of schools? And if so, which documents and how should, how should they differ? Or, or what's your experience of what does a liberal arts school look for in an application that may be different than people who are more familiar with different types of systems? So should I, should I go now? I wasn't sure. Yeah. If I'm oh, yes, go, go ahead. Thank you. So um, I'm talking now as someone who has sat on the other side of the hiring process quite a bit. I've seen a lot of applications and I've been on a lot of hiring committees. Uh, and um, I mean, it's important if you apply to liberal arts colleges to, uh, to decide for yourself if that's somewhere you want to be. So I, I don't think you will be happy there if you don't enjoy teaching. Um, and that should be reflected in the teaching statement. I think it's important to put a lot of thought into the teaching statement and uh, make it clear how you engage a classroom and talk about what has worked and what hasn't worked and what you tried. Um, I would also make a different cover letter that emphasizes that a little bit, though you should write in your cover letter about your research, uh, possibly avoiding technical terms and making it a, as broad as possible. Um, it's also a huge bonus if you can come up with some ideas of possible projects with undergraduates. A lot of the liberal arts colleges like to see that you are at least interested in doing that. So at the place where I am, it's not an expectation that you do research with undergraduates, but it is valued if you can do it and it is supported. So if you can put that in your research statement as well, even if you've never done research with undergraduates before, I think that's also very valuable. And then when you write your research statement, I would also write two versions, one for the uh, more um, research intense places and one for liberalized colleges. So be proud of your research and talk about your uh, what you've done, but try to keep it uh, in terms that are understandable to a general mathematical audience, because it could well be that there is no specialist in your area at the place where you are applying. Thank you, Christina. Marie, thoughts? Well, I have a little bit about um, coming from my experiences at University of Tennessee. I haven't actually been on a hiring committee yet, um, but I have I have um, been involved in the process. You know, after our department has determined its shortlist and, and brought in um, its, its candidates for in-person interviews. Um, so our department. Um, when it's hiring for tenure track positions, um, really cares a lot about uh, the research. I would say, um, I, don't, I wouldn't have guessed this before, but I think probably the CV is the most important document because we use it to sort of get a sense of who someone is um, very quickly. And then I would say that the research statement and the letters of support um, are also important. Um, I'd, I'd be surprised if most people look at any other documents. Very true. Um, for postdocs, 
I would actually for postdocs and for their tech positions, I would encourage you to contact people that you might know that are in the departments where you're applying. Um, I I can't say for certain, but so my department is we we just hired like three postdocs, or you know, we're in the process. I don't know, it's not finished yet, but I think it's safe to say that if someone applied but didn't contact any faculty members in the department, they might have, I think that if there's a good chance their application wasn't considered at all. Um, I don't know if that's common or if that's just like a huge fail um, in my <laughs> department, maybe both, probably both. Um, and I, thinking back to my um, experience when I was on the job market, I would say that. Um, there was a lot of that going on, um, contacting people when I was applying, and I and I'm sure that it had a big impact on the position I got as well. Uh, so yeah. I would encourage you to do that. I think I don't know if it's just me that cares about this, or if other people also care. I know some of us care. I think it's a really good idea for you to have a website that says things about you if someone. Um, has applied somewhere, and there's you know, there are lots of faculty members that are sort of looking at our candidate, and we'll just Google that person and try to look for their academic website and find out more. Doesn't need to have like tons more information than your application itself, but it seems to have some like academic like, presence, or, or even if somebody sees you give a talk and they see you give a 20 minute talk or see your name and they just Google you. And they won't make a lot of effort to figure out if it's not doesn't come up on Google right away, they might forget about you. But if they notice that you're giving a talk, Google you really quick, and then they see it, then then they see some things that then they remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, I think that's all I have for now. So Christina, go ahead and add. Yeah, go ahead, Christina. Yes, it just occurred to me that. I think one thing is important to do if you can while you are on the job market is to give a talk at the joint meetings. Um, there, there used to be this place where people were interviewing. I don't know if it's still happening or not. A lot of liberal arts colleges set up informal interviews to basically check people out. But the talk you are giving at the joint meetings is also an opportunity for people whose shortlist you made to come and see how you are in the classroom. I, they want to hear about your, your research too, but they also want to see how you present. And I think that is a great way to really put yourself on the shorter shortlist. Absolutely. And I think um, I've always heard from Ken, and I think this is good, that um, uh, if you are going to the joint math meetings and you're applying, regardless of whether you're giving a talk, put in your cover letter, I will be at the joint math meetings. Or when you contact people, you should mention it. And you know, there's so many people there in most departments of reasonable size. It doesn't have to be someone on the committee. The committee will often ask somebody else that they know in their department who just happens to be there and they may they may sit in your talk even if they're not from your area there could be someone secretly in the back or or they may contact you and ask to get a coffee or something um yeah but you have to tell them that you're that you're there or they they won't contact you i have a, a tangentially related question for the other panelists and much more experienced members of the audience um so i'm differentiating um between applying for postdocs and tenure track positions when do you know that you're in a position as a postdoc to apply for tenure track positions and put investor time, right? Because uh, at least from what I've heard is tenure track applications take a lot more time, often um, than postdoc applications. So when do you really know that you're ready to invest all of that time in applying? Mm -hmm. Christina or Marie, any thoughts? Or? So I don't know if this is still great advice, uh, but when I was on the job market in 2014, I applied to every single job that I might want. And it was like, um, 
you know, I spent so much time applying for jobs, but I did it. Like I spent half, you know, I spent a lot of that. It's, it's, I think, I think it might be worth the time. Yeah, so I guess the question is, is it worth the time giving up on research and teaching time that you have available to apply for jobs that you might not be able to get? Say tenure track jobs at top R1 institutions, for example. Where's kind of the cut off for? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. And I guess, like, for me, I would just, what I have actually done is I've just gone to the places where I kind of want to be or maybe in the future. And I just look at the CVs of the most junior tenure track faculty and I see if one of my CV is comparable. Yeah, if it's good. not, then it's a great idea. Looking, if it is, uh, did you guys say that in the room? So there was a suggestion from an audience member saying that um, if you're wondering if you have a chance um, and should bother filling out the application, you can look at the CVs of um, that department's new hire mm -hmm. and see if your CV is possible. Um, but I will say in that case, like, I mean, I'm the only person in my department that anybody remembers ever getting a tenure track position without a postdoc, but like, I'm really glad I applied. <laughs> so, um, don't restrict too much because of that. Nick, did you have your hand, or hand up or? Yeah, I, I think that there are things you can learn from doing a round of applications that nobody in any panel could ever tell you and that you'll only learn when you actually do it. So I think the answer to your question is you're ready right now, so just do it. And maybe don't do like a huge, don't, don't like, like Marie said, she applied to every job. Maybe, okay, maybe you don't do that, but like you'll learn so much on the first round of applications that like when you do it again, it'll be that much better. And, and the hardest part of writing your research statement will help you think about your research problems anyway and isn't a complete waste of time. Yeah, yeah. And also, you can recycle some of the materials next year, so you, yeah. you're just improving it. But I, I don't know who said that from the audience, but I agree. Every interview, every Zoom interview you get, it's it's a great rehearsal opportunity. Even if you don't get the job, you are only getting better by doing that. Yeah. But that being said, yes, you probably shouldn't spend 50% of your time just applying to 200 jobs and not get any research done for a semester that it, and, and you don't have a chance at any of them. That's not really productive, but but it is worth some amount of time, I think. Yeah, Isla. I also think that an important factor to consider is what sort of trajectory you want your life to have. So there is a certain amount of time that's taken up by doing postdocs, and there's and there's a toll that it takes if you're moving every two years. And so um, you might prioritize taking a tenure, like applying for a tenure track job before you're maybe ready for a job at Princeton or something. Like maybe if you did five year, more years of postdocs, you might get that dream paper and be able to think that you can get your dream job at the best university you can imagine, but it also might be worth it for you personally to consider that you also want your personal life to move forward in a certain way. And you might want to have some stability where you're living, and I think that's a valid choice to make. And there's also something that I think from a like in the postdoc world, there's a sort of perspective that postdocs are temporary and tenure track jobs are permanent. And that is true in that postdocs end and tenure track jobs don't. But if you're in a tenure track job, you're not like you're not chained to that job. So if you think of it as that you can move when you want to, instead of when like that you have control now over when you want to move versus the job having control, then I think that makes it worth applying to tenure track jobs earlier. Yeah. I agree with that. That actually reminds me, Isla, of how I felt um, the first couple of years. Um, 
at University of Tennessee, like I don't think going straight to tenure track to have a postdoc was a great idea in all ways. Like I didn't know things that, that I would have otherwise known, and I think I would find um, in some ways in terms of my current not behind, but you know, like I was less prepared, and I think it showed. Um, but you know, for personal reasons, it was overall a great thing. And as far as uh, we, uh, <clears throat> Nick was saying that, uh, and others were saying that it's good practice to apply for jobs and, and that you learn a lot anyway. Um, but I had the thought that um, in addition to that, even if you don't get the job, it's also visibility. So you never know why you didn't get a job. It might be for political reasons in the department or your area just might not be the area of priority that year. But it, you, your application still may stand out to someone that that you know you could have been one spot from the shortlist and you'd never know, or your application could have really stood out to someone that then remembers you and, and keeps you in mind for the next time. So um, it, it still it still gets your name out and um, more generally. And I know this has happened to this has really benefited some people in this room. Um, at least in the American system, this is less true. For instance, in the German system, if a job application says it's for a particular area. Um, that doesn't necessarily, and you're not in that area, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't apply. So if you do number theory and it says, um, you know, we want to hire a graph theorist or we want to hire someone in algebra, that doesn't, you know, that might just be, it might be a close tie. There, there could be multiple areas of uh, priority or sometimes departments will just hire someone that's really strong or there's no one strong enough in that area. I mean, if it says we want to hire someone on this grant to do genetic sequencing, that probably won't work out, but like, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, if a play, if they say that's their area of preference, you don't have to exactly fit that in order to be considered. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Nicholas. So it's, it's similar, I think, to the German system, or at least in the Austrian system. Uh, there are one or two American postdocs who stayed in Europe, and that's one of the best ways they they adapted. Is they 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 changed their their they can change their expertise altogether. But they specialize in the subjects. They stu study and adapt to different subjects. They don't just stay in the same. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I, I, we have one other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Krishna, yes. yes. So I will just share a couple of things in connection with what I did in the 70s. I'm the <laughs> oldest member of this audience. Frank Robin does not get it And what I have observed recently as an administrator. So I think this is an important point. Um, you may be very competent, you may have a very strong file, you may have a very strong statement, but in order to actually get to a position where the department makes a job offer, it's not just the uh, selection committee that needs to be impressed with you. Also important is the fact that the faculty member who is not on the committee is able to go and talk to the committee and say, I know this candidate, I have observed so and so at conferences, this individual is very good, take a serious look at it. That actually is very important, which means I think it's important for young applicants to actually contact a member of the department by just sending reprints or writing a letter, drawing attention to the fact that you have applied to that place, expressing your strong interest in working with that group or with that individual. And there's a chance that this person could actually go and talk to a committee member and, and you know, endorse your application. And that actually will happen. It happened in my case. So that's why I'm telling you. And I didn't apply to 100 places. So I finished my PhD at UCLA in 78. I chose about, I think, about 15 universities where new people and whose programs I was interested in. But I wrote to professors in each of these 15 universities. And uh, so it was a successful thing. And even my position at the University of Florida, the advertisement was for an assistant professorship in combinatorics, but they gave me an associate professorship in number theory. So mm -hmm. again, because somebody went and talked to the chair. So I think this is important to, to the committee. So I think it's important that you also, uh, besides all these statements, also contact one of the members of the all right, well, thank you very much, Krishna. Yes, it, as many, oh, Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I yeah. know this is true, or I've heard that this is true, I don't actually know if I, but um, I've, 
I've heard this is true at both liberal arts colleges, but also at Tennessee University, University of Tennessee, we really care about whether the applicant wants to go there. So, um, if the applicant, what questions the applicant is asking? Are you asking about what it's like to live in Knoxville, Tennessee, or you know whatever? Um, if you contact people that are in the department, um, all of those things show that you actually are seriously interested. And, you know, that sometimes the departments aren't just judging you, they're also worried about whether you want to come there. And so, um, in addition to getting noticed, it also makes you seem excited about being part of the department and you want colleagues that are excited to work with us. Yes, great, great point. Um, oh, go ahead. Just piggybacking on Marie's thing. Um, it, if you say in your materials that you're excited about being at a place, you should actually be excited about that. Yes. You should make connections, but not stretch them so that they're not believable. Yeah. You make, well, not just believable, but not true. Either. Yes. You want them to actually be it can but true. Definitely backfire if you if you say my research is very closely connected to this and it is just false then or it's very bad or yes. i just really would love to live in the in the middle of the coldest place in the country and you just put that right <laughs> yeah right. yeah go ahead paul uh, going along with that not just the connections you make with your research but the various mathematical jobs that are out there you do have faculty who do very different things there's a big difference between teaching five courses a year at a liberal arts college and teaching fewer courses than that at a, at a major research institution. And uh, having been on the other side of, a, of, of the hiring committee a few times now, you do want to see candidates who want to do what your institution is focused on doing. And if your institution does undergraduate research and someone isn't really excited about undergraduate research, that comes out. And if your institution really cares about providing excellent teaching and a candidate has not cared as much about providing excellent teaching in their, in their uh, career to that point, that comes out too. Hmm. And, and there does need to be a little, some, uh, some match between what the institution wants and what you want to spend the rest of your career doing. Yeah, and I think I think this is being said implicitly, but I feel like my advisor told me really explicitly when I was on the market that it's not about a department offering you a job. Like it's not a one-way thing. That you need to come to a point where you realize that you're interviewing them as well, mm -hmm. you know, and you need to be getting something that you actually want out of the transaction. Like it should be a two-way thing where your employer wants you and you want your employer too. And so like it is, I think it makes the process better once you can get to that point where you feel like you have something to offer. That's great. And it should want to, you know, like it, the point is to find the right match, yeah. not just a job. And uh, building on what Paul said, I can also say that um, being on some some hiring committees, um, uh, one of the besides that you want someone that's a good match, that's a good fit, that will be happy there, and you know for a tenure track or permanent that will stay there and be retained. But another thing that happens too is that like well, for example, for postdocs, um, you may want to fill a certain number of positions, and it's estimated that some people won't accept the position, so you're able to give a number of initial offers. And sometimes the dean will say, "This is how many offers you can get, and uh, or you can give." And if too many people say no, it can be really hard to ask the dean to let you make a second round of offers. You may not be, uh, the, you may not be a lot, you may not be given that uh, permission from the dean to do that again. And so there is a lot of judging of, um, you know, we want to go for a few of the very strongest people, perhaps, but after the very few strongest, we really want to try to judge, will they actually come here? Because if a bunch of them say no, we will have unfilled spots and then we'll have a teaching gap and we like won't fill, we'll like have uh, hiring lines that we're not using. And same thing with, with, with tenure track, you know, we maybe only are able to, there's a limited number, there might be three or four different places, whatever number of people that we can interview, 
And if we use those interview spots on certain people, there's only so much money that's given to us to, to give interviews. And, you know, we really want to know that if, if all four people are really not that interested in, or likely to come, then that can be a failed job search. And, you know, then you have to completely re-ask again and the, and the position may be lost. So departments really don't want that to happen. Um, and that kind of conversation happens a lot, I think. Great. I can uh, piggyback on that. Yeah. What Larry just said, um, to say that on, on your side of that, like it's very, especially if you're a PhD student, it's important that you are communicating with your supervisor uh, about what sorts of jobs you want and where you are in the decision process. And uh, because those sorts of considerations, the job can't reach out to you and directly and say, like, it's weird for them to reach out to you directly and say, are you going to take this job? Because you're not going to give them an honest answer. But yeah. <laughs> certain jobs, like, I jobs did call my PhD supervisor and say, and like, get an idea of like, if we give her an offer, is she going to accept it? And like, there was one place in particular that I really thought I did well in the interview. I really was expecting an offer. Um, but I already had other offers from other places and my supervisor said, no, like it really sounds like she's made up her mind that she's going to go to this place, which was true. Like I was not, uh, I was not going to accept that job, but I didn't actually get an offer because like some conversation had happened third party that they had found out that I wasn't going to go. Right. So um, if there is a job you really want, you want to make sure that your advisor knows that because they might be able to, yeah, they might be in conversations about it behind your back on your behalf. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a really excellent point. And I think when you're young, you don't realize how how often there are. Uh, I, I don't want to say that it's not like uh, dirty politics or something, but how how often there are conversations on the side between people that, that just have known each other for decades, and a lot of these conversations behind the scenes are moving a lot of things in the job market. And yeah. Um, well, I want to steer the conversation a little bit. We had we've had some really good discussion and uh, about this. So I'm, 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 it's if we don't get to one or two of the things, I think that's fine because we've had lots of great, uh, a very interactive discussion. But there was one particular thing we wanted to get in that we wanted to mention that the panel came up with, uh, and Christina suggested in particular that we thought would be really useful for the community, and that we wanted to ask all of the audience uh, as well. And Christina, I know you created a, a word document. Um, I can't open that one and look at these other comments in my computer, my phone right now, but if you want to also point that out. So we were talking about how, in general, it's a difficult question of how do you find good letter writers or how do you approach people? How do you ask them to write a letter? And if we had more time, we could probably discuss that as well. Um, but we wanted to talk about how it's especially difficult in the pandemic with people not travel, going to conferences as much and young people in particular not being, you know, they're not invited to very many seminars, which is one of the main things happening now, and they just don't have as much visibility. And um, we were, were discussing how one of the best ways to get a good letter um, when you're young, you know, you're going to probably get a letter from an advisor, your advisor, or maybe a second advisor, how do you find other letters? One of the best ways to do that is there are various research communities where you work on a research project intensely with people, um, and then often with a more senior person, and that person can write you a really strong letter um, that's very specific. So Christina was compiling a list, right? We had women, women in number theory, women in math, and the much more recent one, rethinking number theory. Um, and were there any others on the list, Christina, that we came up with? Just, uh, just a second to look at my list. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, while, oh, so yeah. There is one, I don't know how relevant it is for this particular group. It's called a pair of automorphic workshops. And I think that's taking place in July. And there are also the AMS math research communities. And those have diff different areas of research from year to year, but it's worth keeping a, an eye on that to, to looking at what's happening. One other place that I didn't put on the list, but it just occurred to me now, it's the workshops at AIM, the American Institute of Mathematics, because those workshops are 
usually in the morning there are talks and in the afternoon people work together on things and they are not as structured as women in number theory for example you could go to to one group and try to work on Monday. And if you don't like what they are doing on Tuesday, you can go to a different group. But oftentimes a group will gel at, at AIM and they end up writing a paper together. So that those workshops are a great, a great place to, to make connections. If you look on the website of AIM, you can see a list of upcoming workshops and the ones that are fairly far in the future, they are still open for applications and you can just, it's just a simple form that you have to fill out to apply for a spot there. So that might be a good option. Great. Josh or Marie, do you know of any other specific opportunities or we can ask the audience, does anybody in the you know, we were talking and one thing that we realized is there's no central place um, or repository that any of us are aware of where you can find such opportunities. And so, well, firstly, we wanted to task the audience, does anybody have any good ideas for how we can create a repository? You know, the first place I look for conferences often is Number Theory Web, and it has many tabs of different things. Um, and I looked and I didn't see anything like that in Number Theory Web. And even I couldn't find, for instance, Women in Number Theory, which, you know, is a great program and, and I've known about for for years um, and see, you know, just by seeing the work come out essentially from it um, and, and hearing about it, but um, I couldn't find that listed anywhere on number theory web. So, you know, maybe it would be really helpful for the community if somebody has any ideas to create such a repository or contact the web administrator and request that we create a link of a repository of research communities or, or you know, um, research opportunities for people more senior, you graduate students, postdocs, faculty, like RUs, but you know, for, for older people. Um, and then my other, so if anybody has a question, an idea on that from the audience, that would be great. And my other question is, does anybody in the audience know about any of these opportunities that we haven't mentioned yet that we don't know about? Well, as far as grad students soliciting external letters, I would, I think it once, I think it really is to engage with the seminar speakers that the institution brings, right? So just by attending the seminar, like being engaged and then, I mean, there's like 12 or 13 talks a semester. So usually there's gonna be a few that you're interested in. This is a really, go to the lunch, go to the dinner. This is a good way to break the ice with some of these people so that if you actually send them an email, they know who you are, you know, you can develop yes. a relationship because you just don't want to send an email saying, hey, you know, my name is X, Y, Z. Yeah. You know, I finished your grad school. Well, no, but I mean, they want to, they can say more if they know you for a long period of time in a more meaningful way and they know your results. Yeah. I mean, not only they might not want to just buy you, they might want to hire you. You know, you just don't know this. So, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, Isla. Um, another way is to just go to a lot of conferences because you want to be like to Krishna's point that you want to write to someone when you're applying to a job, you need to write to someone in the department that helps if you know that person. And um, usually the abstracts, like, or at least the schedules of conferences stay online for like years afterwards. So you don't have to remember exactly where, like, if you just remember that you met them somewhere and then you can find the details online and put it in your email. Um, but that helps. And then if you go to conferences and you give talks at conferences, then maybe by your fourth or fifth year, someone has seen you give several talks. Um, so I had external letter writers, and I, ne I never collaborated with anyone until my postdoc. All of my, all of my research was just my own dissertation research. Um, but I had two letters from outside people who just knew me from one from they came and gave seminars, and I talked to them then, and then the other from I had been to several conferences, mm. and they had seen me speak on a number of different topics. Mm. And so. Um, so these learning communities are great, but like I'm just saying, there are other ways also yes. to get external letters. If you don't have an opportunity to do that, don't think, oh no, I can't ever get a letter. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I have to stress what Alex said, go really, really go to lot, go to the lunches at these things and, and talk to people during the break. This is like absolutely essential. If you just go to the talks and you sit in the back and you don't talk to people in the lunch or the breaks, they won't know who you are. Uh, yeah. One other point. Um, again, going back to what happened in the 70s, but this really helped me. My thesis advisor, Ernst Strauss, 
when I first picked my the three members of my PhD committee who were supposed to write letters for me, he actually said, all three of your members are from number theory and that's not good. You select one of your top professors who's outside of number theory, but you know, in whose class you have done very well. So he, in my case, he suggested a top algebraist. And, his, and he said, these number theorists will always write letters for you because they have seen you in the seminar. So this algebraist was so well known this point was there might be members you know in a search committee who may identify uh, this individual rather than the number theorist. so sometimes it is good to have outside of your area of specialty but somebody very well known in your department internationally known in your department whose courses you have taken and who have done well and that person can write a letter great great point um we have a couple i'm just noticing i should have Pay more attention uh, to this. We have a few people in, in the Zoom chat. So uh, Dennis says suggests Park City MSRI, and then I'm just going to click this. It says ISPCMI. Um, oh, that's Park City. Yes, Park City and MSRI as specific uh, programs that can be considered. Um, and Hannah uh, has her hand uh, risen. Hannah, do you want to just unmute yourself and say something? Yeah. So I wanted to add to these research. Groups, I know at least for women in numbers and for the rethinking number theory, you absolutely do not need to be an expert in any of the areas of proposed problems to get accepted to work in them. And so you should apply if like a problem looks interesting, you should apply uh, because they often like part of it is giving the background and having people come from diverse research backgrounds. Um, and I know rethinking number theory like explicitly says this on their website, but I don't think women in numbers and the other ones do as much. Yes, that's a really good point. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and I have, uh, I, I realized we had one other suggestion before that we were talking about. I think Christina pointed this out when we were talking, and that is not quite one of the research programs necessarily more specific. And that is that at the JMM, JMM there's a uh, AWM program matching junior women with, with mentors and then um, there's some mentoring going on and there's also an event afterwards. Um, I don't know if you wanna say a few words about the, that Christine, I don't know a lot about the program. I've done this a few years ago and I don't remember exactly how it works. So it's, it's a mentoring opportunity, but it's really, it just happens over one day. So the mentors usually go to the, uh, to the poster session. Uh, if, especially if they are mentee, they were, uh, they were matched with is giving a poster and then you will give some feedback on that. And then there is this event where people just have, coffee and pastries together and uh and just you know the the junior person can ask any questions about job applications about life in a new department about how to decide on next steps so that's something i think if people look up on the website of awm i'm hoping that they are still doing this that they will find that there again i'll, I'll try to do a better job at maybe creating a list of all these things that people have suggested and uh, see if I can get anybody at the, the uh, number theory web to create a link for such things. Great, that would be really helpful. And Christina, yeah, we could try number, if you ask number theory web and I'm happy if you, if you have a list, I'm, I'm very happy to post it on our website. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I, I want to let the audience ask any question they want as well. Uh, but I wanted um, to ask one more thing, uh, and that's that Marie, um, you were talking, you had a very good point about asking people to launch and repeatedly asking people to launch. And I thought maybe you could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so when we met to chat um, an event of this to sort of talk about what kinds of things we wanted to, to say and discuss, um, one of the things we, one of the things we wanted to discuss was um, ways to, like support systems that there are for young young people, um, and also women and people from other underrepresented groups. And I sort of told a story about how when I started at University of Tennessee, I mean, um, we don't have very many women in our departments, and so 
I, the the women that are senior to me, um, there there just aren't there just aren't very many. They, they are great role models, but I feel like they don't have very many role models. Um, but one of the things that really made me feel comfortable and welcome was um, that one of them invited me to lunch. Actually, she invited me to have lunch with her and um, you know another colleague, but every week. And so every week um, until our lives got too busy for it, for it. Um, we would meet and have lunch like on Wednesdays just in our office. And that's one of the things that um, like as a newcomer and as a woman, it helped me feel more, you know, part, part of the group. And so um, that has stood out in my mind as a time when I got a lot of support. But I feel like thinking, I mean, I guess I'm an associate professor now, so maybe it doesn't well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, it, I guess I struggle with feeling like, um, like a grown up. I don't view myself as an established person yet. And I think when I, I realized that even if you aren't an established person, or even if you don't feel like an established person, it's still never too early to sort of put out your hand to others to help create. Um, relationships and to support each other. And so I feel like this kind of thing where you know you reach out and say, hey, let's have lunch and just talk about our, you know, our lives. Um, but that that can be a way of like creating a sense of community um, at whatever institution you're at. And so I think um, so that's something that all of us could I think be leaders in regardless of where we are helping them. Like, so let's. I guess I wanted to give like a pep talk to you. Like, let's make our institutions, our departments, our communities like more supportive. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe to piggyback on the back of that, as a junior person, don't feel like you can't ask your professors or your supervisor out to lunch as well. It's not a one way dynamic, it's not. Um, something that they have to approach you situationally, right? So you go to a conference and you, you see someone who works in a similar area and you'd like to get to know them um, a bit more. Maybe you want to have collaborating or ask for a letter at some point. Um, the vast majority of people are very nice and just people. So just ask them to go to lunch or go to dinner or grab a coffee. And so you can talk about your work and your lives, just get to know them a bit more. It shouldn't be too scary. Absolutely. And, um... Thank you very much for those comments, Marie. I think that um, that's those are very inspiring uh, comments. And uh, you know, we started the the panel by talking about the pandemic, and I've heard a lot of stories from people at different career stages. And I've heard from a lot of we have a few undergraduates at, uh, in the audience, and as well, and especially from undergraduates that I've talked to and, and known, and graduate students. It's been really hard to build community, and it's something that we always should have worked on improving, but it's. It's kind of especially been been broken now, um, and it's something that we all, and especially the more senior people, should probably really make a strong effort to to build. Um, yeah. Well, we're essentially out of time, um, and I want to give people a chance to. You know, we we had a pretty full schedule today, so I want to give people a chance to talk to each other uh, before we go to dinner. Um, but uh, are there any uh, last uh, Big questions or or comments um, that that you, that the audience would like to say on um, on any topic. It doesn't have to be related to what we discussed. Yes, I have a very naive question. So, do you apply to anything, or get, or is there a list of places that are looking for applicants? Math jobs. Yeah, so there's um, math jobs is the one that most people know. I mean, actually, Amanda brought up. I was discussing this over lunch. There's another website. But we're not quite sure of the name of um, what we think. Um, right, so mathjobs.org is um, like the uh, place to look for many jobs, um, largely in the US. There's, there's another website, um, something like um, higher ed jobs, something mm -hmm. like this. Um, and on that website, you can find many jobs at institutions. Um, that are not listed on map jobs might be like um, perhaps not the flagship 
campus of a state university, but their satellite campuses, maybe like UMass Boston versus UMass Amherst or UW Eau Claire versus UW Madison or something like this. Um, and many more academic jobs are posted there. That's another place to look. I don't know how many people look there. I mean, these jobs might um, entail like a slightly higher teaching load, um, but you know, all all uh, institutions are different. Um, it's really not a binary system of liberal arts versus you know <laughs> high level research university. There's absolutely everything in between. Um, so there's, there's a lot of places to um, look and apply to, and as many people have already said, it, it, it's a matter of, of finding uh, that right fit. Yeah, I know, like, I, I guess I haven't been there since about two years ago, but I know that if you go to the AMS website, there's some kind of thing, like from their main page that can get you to um, some um, academic job listing in my position. It might be a higher job, I'm not sure, um, or it might be some other one. And so I, I know that I went there and, you know, found up, maybe I did apply to too many places, I don't know. Um, and that was helpful to see all those other jobs. I mean, so the thing that the bummer is like, if you want, if you're a department and you want to post on that job or you want to interview people at JMM or whatever, like that's not free. The department's paying to do that. Yeah. And so the departments that can't pay for that can't do that. And so that's where these are. There are these other like, and that options that are worth finding. Yeah. Great. Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, if not, I think we should uh, end here and let's thank our panelists very much for. So I'll end the recording, but leave the Zoom on just for. Uh,